Hey, it's Amy Shaw, the Soul Whisperer here. I'm a practicing shaman in the Austin, Texas area. This is my second video today, and again, this video is going to be a little bit different than anything I've done on my channel before. In the last video, I did a brief book review as I was just talking about connecting with nature. Uh, and that's the first time that I have actually done, you know, a, a book review or any type of media review on this particular channel. This video, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to talk about some cards that I recently got for my birthday. I was so excited I um, wanted them and I'm excited to have them. Um, but I'm also going to weave it in that discussion about my own past in history, um, working with tarot or tarot cards and um, how that differs from shamanic div divination. So let me start by talking about my personal history real brief um, with um, tarot cards. So when I was much, much younger, like pre-adolescence, um, into my early adolescence, I started delving into the occult. When I say occult, I mean things like ESP, um, palm reading, um, tarot reading, uh, Ouija boards, and that type of thing. Um, I was just curious, and um, I was exploring a lot of different things. I dabbled in a lot of things. Uh, I had a Rider weight deck. Um, I had a Ouija board, um, all that kind of stuff, and I just dabbled um, with a lot of stuff. I was curious. And so um, as time went on, um, I moved around a lot. I spent some time being homeless, so a lot of that stuff got lost or stolen or it just turned up missing. Um, certain things did stick with me. Um, one of them was uh, my Ouija board, which um, at some point uh, in my um, late teens, early adulthood, I... Um, got rid of that. I chose to get that out of my house to not have it anymore. Um, soon after that, I started uh, attending a Protestant church, and then I went through this whole experience of um, becoming a Christian, and, and I stayed for over a decade within the Protestant church um, in that system and, and learning um, about that. So, of course, I put all that occult stuff aside during that period in my life, the only thing that actually stayed with me um, through all the years, going way back from, you know, when I first started um, dabbling with the occult, is this one um, set, um, and you can see it's qu it is quite old. I, I bought it brand new, um, Stargate. Uh, it's the one I didn't get rid of, I didn't lose, and one I continued to do readings with um, for years later. Um, Stargate is, is quite different than typical um, tarot cards, tarot, however you choose to say it. Um, I'll briefly just show you kind of what these cards look like, although um, this video is not a review on Stargate. Um, I'm just sharing with you that this is the one um, card system that survived with me from my very early, early um, time in the in the early 80s actually of dabbling with um, cards and occultish things so this is a typical stargate card it just says crown and on the back it tells you um, it's it's a square um, the sign for it is square and um, the words that are given are leadership and guidance um, so it's a very interesting system. Um, it comes with this little layout um, mat where you lay the cards out in a certain way. Um, it's very what I would call archetypal. So they're just basic symbols, very common, almost universal symbols. So in that sense, it's a very archetypal s sort of system and it deviates from like your traditional writer weight where you have your major um, arcana and that type of thing. So I kept it just because it's unique. It's different. It's, it's, um, it has that more archetypal feeling to it. And I do um, occasionally pull this out and use it with clients in session, particularly if they're really wanting or expecting some type of reading um, on that level. Um, people can really kind of connect, um, you know, to the materialism of having cards in front of them, the visuals. And, and, uh, and that deck in particular I really like because it doesn't, it's not translational. It doesn't really require me to translate it. Um, actually, when I do readings with clients, on this um, I typically have them tell me what the cards mean to them let's just say they pulled this card um, sword and depending where it falls on the mat you know on the layout mat 
um, you know, I allow them to tell me what this means to them. And it, that sounds like, well, maybe I just don't know what I'm doing, or maybe it's a lazy way of getting about it. Um, no, the reason that I do that is because I inherently believe that people, we have our own innate wisdom, our own innate intuition, our own knowing. And so I would much rather empower people by being their guide, by holding the space and allowing them you know, guiding them as I need to by asking the right questions to uh, tap in and bring out their own inner wisdom than for me to tell them, oh, you drew this card and it means this and this is going to happen and that's going to happen. Um, using tarot cards, I know from personal experience of having been on the other side of the table, um, it's very often a form of sorcery and I have certainly had more than one client who's come to me who's had a tarot reading from somebody out in the community maybe at a metaphysical fair or something like that and they've actually suffered a curse because of that I'm not saying that all tarot readers are bad people and they're and they're out there you know practicing sorcery and cursing people um, a lot of them are unconscious about it and they're approaching their skill and their practice from a certain place and um, it's um, just ignorant of how easy it is uh, to fall into sorcery and how easy it is to curse people. And so essentially they give people what they want. And, and I see this happen all the time because I do the metaphysical fairs um, quite often. Um, people are coming to the fairs and that's what they're looking for. They're looking to pay people to hand their power over to them. Um, they're looking to pay people to tell them what's going to happen in their life, how to deal with the situation, you know, why is this happening? All, you know, all these kinds of questions that people come with. Um, they're looking for somebody else to tell them, to guide them. So what I do, um, you know, in my personal shamanic practice is I help empower people and find their own answers to these things. Um, I just find that a more rewarding uh, practice and I feel for myself that it allows me to keep my integrity and it guards me against stealing people's power away, especially taking money to take people's power away from them um, and to help empower them. So when I go to the metaphysical fairs, <clears throat> one of the only decks I ever take with me, and I usually do take it because people like cards and it's interesting, it's a great conversation starter, is the Spirit Animal deck by Kim Kranz. I love that. Um, before the Spirit Animal deck, I had her um, Wild Unknown deck, which is a much more traditional um, Rider weight style tarot deck. Um, again, I've n not done very many readings for people using that deck. Um, I, it's just not a modality I'm comfortable with. I've done a lot of readings for myself um, using that deck. Um, and for me, and I'll get into this in a minute, but anyway, Kim Kranz, I've been a fan of her work for since the wild unknown. And then when she came out with Spirit Animal, I was super excited. So, of course, I bought that. And that is the one deck that I do take with me to the Metaphysical Fair. How I use it is not to do readings for people per se, but as conversation pieces, um, educational pieces, um, and also um, to do some power retrieval for them using the cards. And, and how that happens is just an interaction and conversation. I'll allow them to pull a card and then, and then we'll talk about it. And so, yeah, that's always my goal and focus is to do power retrieval with them whenever I use um, the cards. Um, but when I just recently found out that Kim came out with a new deck um, and it's on archetypes, I was super excited. I put it on my birthday list. I recently had a birthday and so I'm super excited to share that with you today. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and move into that. And then I'll talk about how using cards is different than shamanic uh, divination. So this is the cover um, thing, the little box slides in there. Um, it's quite large. I mean, considering how large it is, the price on it is really great. Um, and I just love her work. Um, it comes with a book. I, I've already read um, the beginning of it. It's, it's wonderful. She tells the story about how she developed the archetypes, um, how she had to actually... Um, uh, cull some of the archetypes. She had over 250 and she knew that that was way too many for a deck. Uh, so she talks about that process of um, pruning some of that back. Um, she gives examples of how to do readings using the cards. Um, my favorite um, example that she has um, 
Oh, and of course, she talks about archetypes versus stereotypes, which I love that because that is a big one with me. I'm often talking about the difference between archetypes and stereotypes as I'm talking about archetypal shamanism and how important it is to understand the difference. And this deck also has suits in it, which I find is interesting. The suits are the selves, the places, the tools, and the initiations. And then she talks about, let's see, um, this one, the inner quest, um, is my favorite, um, sort of reading that she shares. Um, it, she has them putting into stacks, um, based on their suits and she's got who, where, with what, and why. So you do a reading of four cards, um, with this deck, as you can see there. And um, I just love that. So now I'll just show you the box. Um, it's a beautiful, very hard box. Um, beautiful. Her typical style, that kind of watercolor with these rich, beautiful colors. It has a magnetic um, you know, flap. So the flap opens. And um, inside, it's this wonderful box with a round. The book goes on top. It has, you know, the ribbon to help pull it out of the box. Um, it says, reject none, accept all. And then the cards are round, so it has a little round, hard um, container for the cards themselves. And again, um, we have a ribbon to help pull the cards out, because they can be difficult to get out. They do fit in there rather tightly. And they're just beautiful. They're her typical style. Um, on the back, I don't care for the back as much. Um, it's a faceted diamond, but it, it is it's in a gray. It's not really in a color, a full color. Um, it actually looks better, I think, on the camera than it does in person. It's kind of a dull um, black, black and white imagery. It's not full color. Um, but these cards are just gorgeous, and I, I'm loving the archetypes. Um, here's the underworld, and then we have the sustainer, we have the creator, which I love the colors on this, the destroyer, beautiful, magical, absolutely magical, that looks like a wolf. Um, again, another very beautiful, colorful, typical Kim Crayons, The Self. Um, the Pilgrim, this one is very interesting. Um, the Venom, that's really interesting too, wow. <laughs> Trying to get the orientation right on this. Um, here's another one, the Gnosis, or Gnosis, Knowledge, beautiful cards. The Threshold, wow, what, that's a very, really powerful archetype, isn't it? Um, again, another beautiful card, uh, the Mentor absolutely gorgeous. I'm just loving this deck. I'm super excited to have it. Can't wait to actually really use it. The Shaman. I love the snake and look at the three skulls. I mean just simply magical. Oh and the diamond. Um, and what is that? A hand. It almost looks like it was pierced. Absolutely stunning, amazing, magical. I just love her work, her cards. They really speak to me a lot. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole deck. I just want to show you some of them. The Orphan. Um, again, look at that. It's almost like an Ouroboros snake wrapped around itself. And then a flower. Beautiful pink flowers. Kind of wilted. And sort of like this hand. Almost looks dead, right? Like a dead child. The shadow, of course. Beautiful. We're in shadow season right now, aren't we? 
um, the offering. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Again, that just speaks of sacrifice. I feel like a very sacrifice energy, a sacrificial energy in that. So anyways, yeah, these, these are the cards, um, and I'm super excited. I haven't had the opportunity yet. I just got these um, to really delve into them. Um, I've just looked briefly through them all. I haven't used them. Last night I did, today's December 22nd, so last night I did a solstice offering um, with a dear friend of mine, and I was mentioning to her that I had just got this deck and I was really excited about it, and she mentioned to me that she also had an archetype uh, deck by Carolyn Miss. I wasn't an aware that Carolyn had an archetype deck, so um, my friend um, offered to show them to me, and so I looked through them. Um, that is amazing as well. Some of the archetypes that uh, Carolyn has in her deck are amazing. Amazing. I was blown away um, but it's a very different deck um, the cards are very different the imagery is very different my friend said that she didn't personally really use the deck because she didn't care for it she didn't like the artwork and you know for her that's something that has to really resonate with her and after reviewing that deck um, I agree I didn't care for the artwork as well I didn't care for the size of the cards they were quite large um, they were a little glossier than my personal preference. I don't like them to slide around on each other so easily. Um, uh, but but it's different. And so I was happy to review that and see that the archetypes, although some of them are the same as in this deck, um, in Carolyn's deck, they also were very, very different. Um, but powerful, equally powerful, and I may just end up someday buying Carolyn Mrs. deck as well because um, I was impressed by the archetypes that were present. Although I did agree with my friend, I didn't care for the deck nearly as much as I care for this deck. It's it's just gorgeous. It's beautiful. I cannot wait to use it. Um, I see myself um, using this much more in community like I do her spirit animal deck, not necessarily to do traditional tarot readings, um, but to um, do shamanic work. So power retrievals and, and soul retrievals and um, shadow work for sure uh, with people. And so I'm ex super excited about it. Now I want to just move into talking about um, shamanic divination and how it's different um, than, than this because traditionally shamans are from indigenous communities uh, where they don't have cards they can't uh, you know click and buy on Amazon and have it delivered to their house or anything like that so traditionally shamans throughout the centuries a divination was a huge part of shamanic practice a lot of times it was tied to essential aspects of living, like finding where the food source was, um, finding out what the problem was, why winter was so excruciating long, or um, finding out how they could uh, endure winter, or, or even, you know, what the winter coming was going to look like, and so that they could prepare properly with food supply and that type of thing. Um, so divination was a central aspect of shamanic practice in every culture for thousands of years. Um, it was just a part of human survival. And um, again, as I've said a hundred times, the role of the shaman within the community w has not been and still is not an elevated role in, in community. And, and I think people in the West Western cultures, it's hard for us to understand this because we live in a very self-deterministic hierarchical system um, that's very nuclear family oriented and so we're very isolated, we don't know how to live communally, um, we're very competitive, we're very self-determined in what we do and so we come with a Western mindset to this concept of shamanism and, and we want to put shamanism within that same label. And so when we do that, we tend to elevate shamans to, you know, some sort of um, esteemed level and to give them more um, maybe like clout might be the right word than is typical than what we would see in indigenous cultures. That's not to say that shamans don't have a tremendous amount of power because they do, but that power was always seen and is still seen as a way to serve the community, as an integral member of the community, as an equal member of the community. So in tribal society, everybody's equal. You know, the shaman would go out and hunt right alongside with the holy man, right alongside with 
you know, the, the midwife right alongside with, um, the pregnant mother or the warrior or, you know, everybody equally, um, took part, um, as long as the physical ability allowed them to do that. Right. So there wasn't like this idea of like, oh, the shaman, we're going to serve the shaman. We're going to elevate the shaman. Like the shaman is somehow set apart. Although sometimes they were somewhat set apart only because they were peculiar or different, right? And they didn't quite fit in with the social norms or they didn't have the ability to um, sort of quote unquote be normal with the rest of community. So sometimes the shaman was set apart for those reasons though, not because the community itself like elevated them and put them on some kind of throne and put a crown on their head. It wasn't, it wasn't like that. And it still actually is not like that, nor should it be like that. So I'm prefacing all this to say like shamanic divination is just a normal aspect of shamanism. It doesn't, you know, because the shaman used divination as a way to help the community survive, it doesn't mean that they were in some way elevated or more important or more special than the rest of the community. And it still shouldn't be this way. Um, however, times have changed now. We don't live communally, number one, and we don't live indigenous life. So we're not dependent on herds of bison or um, herds of antelope or, you know, herds of any type of animal. We're not dependent on the seasons to dictate, um, you know, our community health and whether we're going to eat plentiful or whether we're going to starve or, you know, whether we're going to have enough clothing. We don't depend on those things as much. So shamanic divination in its traditional sense is becoming less and less um, needed on that level and at the same time more and more needed on a different level as our challenges have evolved and we're still continuing to struggle to learn how to live on this planet in harmony so it's not that shamanic divination has gone away or needs to go away it's that it has ultimately evolved and changed from its historical roots and that's normal, right? A shamanism should grow and change uh, with the times for sure. Um, but in terms of the divination itself, again, you know, because you're hearing me say this and you're thinking, okay, Amy, right? Um, well, if it's growing and changing, then why can't we use cards? I mean, that that's an aspect of modern culture. And so we should be using cards for shamanic divination. Well, yes and no, because shamanic divination traditionally was number one, for the tribe, for the community, always first. And as it pertained to the individual, um, it would typically be used for diagnosing um, illness, um, dis-ease, uh, malady, um, disharmony, um, diagnosing the source of that, and then also um, being able to uh, bring forth a medicine specifically for that. So on an individual level, that is how divination would work um, in a shamanic context. A little bit different than sitting across the table with someone throwing out cards and they're asking, am I ever going to get married? Or I'm not sure if the partner that asked me to marry them is the right one. These are different kinds of issues, more maybe modern issues. We would say first world issues for sure, right? Um, and I'm not saying, you know, like it's wrong or, or that we shouldn't use tarot cards and give readings to people like that. That's for every person in their own to seek that out and to offer those services if they so choose. I'm saying for myself personally and my shamanic practice, I don't offer those kind of services and I don't do divination in that way. So shamanic divination and how it's different than using cards is typically because the ancestors didn't have cards. They had nature, they had trees, they had clouds, they had grass, they had rocks, they had bones, they had all these natural elements. And so it was from these elements that they learned to, to read, to gather vision, and to read the signs. So whether it's reading tree bark or it's reading clouds or um, reading a rock, that type of thing, that is typically how shamanic divination is done. And it's how I have been taught um, as a student of Foundation for Shamanic Studies to do a divination. So for myself, I have two divination 
um, I guess you would call them kits because they're not decks, they're not cards. Um, there, here's one in, in this bag and there's another one in this bag. They're very different um, and you can see I put them in different bags for that specific reason. I personally like to have the option of having two because if someone's act actually asking for divination work and I'm in an environment where I'm not able to immediately access um, a rock or a tree or tree bark or um, you know the sky say I'm in indoors and I'm at a metaphysical fair or I'm sitting with a client inside of an office somewhere I don't have immediate access to that um, it's nice to have these divination kits that I can bring with me and you know I've kind of coded them <laughs> based on um, my relationship with them and which one of these I would use for a client is, is you know, going to depend on the client, um, the situation, um, you know, and everything that's surrounding that. So these external things sort of indicate to me, like, okay, I'm going to use this um, kit or I'm going to use this one. So I'm not going to open it up and share with you what's in it um, for a couple different reasons. But um, I will just summarize by saying that... Um, Every single item that is in uh, my divination kits are items that have been found, specifically chosen um, um, by myself in relationship with the spirits. Um, that they, I've journeyed on every single one. That they've told me specifically what they mean um, and how they're oriented. Um, metaphysically and so what I do is I take them all out um, I pull you know put them in my hand and I essentially throw them um, so how they land in relation to one another um, in the general orientation of each individual object whether it's right side up or it's facing a certain direction that type of thing all of these kind of things um, uh, influence uh, essentially uh, the outcome, the divination, the actual answer or the insight that's that's um, gleaned from uh, doing uh, a divination for someone. Um, and again, I'm very selective when I do this, um, only for certain clients in certain cir circumstances. It's not a common thing. It's not something that I do with every client. Um, generally, I don't need to, I guess. Um, uh, uh, it, it, it really is a material divination having a divination kit is really like a material manifestation of a process that can occur without the deck if that makes sense or without the kit um, but certain clients for whatever reason um, they prefer that they want that they like the corporal you know being able to really like visualize with their eyes and connect to that um, and that in itself can be, you know, a, a medicine, a, a real service. Um, and also sometimes if there's a real difficult case or something that I am unsure about, um, doing shamanic divination will just give me that little extra a bit of insight or clarity that then I can move forward in confidence because I'm like aha okay now now I see um, that little corner that I couldn't see or around that little um, you know angle that I couldn't see now I can see and it, and it gives me the confidence to move forward in doing the work with the person um, going ahead so that is shamanic divination in a nutshell and it's how it's very different from tarot reading and um yeah i i don't know much else i can really say about it um i do occasionally teach uh, shamanic divination um you know in a very um exclusive um small um group setting uh, and uh if you're interested in that um, please feel free to email me. I can keep you on my list. And when I offer that again, I'd love to reach out to you and let you know um, that I'm offering that. Uh, I can do that online and in person if I get enough uh, people um, in the Austin, Texas area that are interested. But primarily, uh, I'm doing that type of thing online. So if you're interested in that, again, drop me an email. Say, hey, Amy, I saw your video on YouTube about shamanic div divination. I'm really interested. 
in learning how to do shamanic divination, in learning how to develop my own divination kit, and sure, I'll keep you on the list. It's it's no problem. If you have any other questions or comments or concerns or encouragements, um, yeah, feel free to leave them below the video. Or as always, if you don't want to be that public with yourself, you're totally free to get a hold of me privately through Facebook Messenger. Um, I have a page on Facebook. It's slash shamanic services or through my email. It's shamanic services at amykshaw.com. Um, make sure you're spelling my name right. Sometimes people just assume I spell it, you know, in the traditional traditional way. So as always, thank you guys for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this. I hope that you felt inspired by Kim's archetype deck. And also that you felt, oh yeah, and that's one more thing before I go. I just wanted to say another deck that I got for my birthday, which I'm not going to really do a review on. This this deck is heavy. It's going to take me um, quite a while to really work with it, to even feel comfortable enough to talk about it. But it also was on my list of stuff I wanted for my birthday, and so I'm really happy to have it. Um, this deck of cards, I would say, is not nearly as... Um, colorful or as beautiful as Kim's work. It's much more basic in that sense, um, but it's also equally um, very magical, and it's the Hermetic Tarot deck, um, and it's very traditional. Um, you know, it has um, the Magician and the Lovers and, you know, the Major Arcana, and it's very, it's very traditional. Um, but I'm super excited um, to actually learn from this deck. That's why I wanted this deck, um, is, is to learn from it. So that's all I can say about that. But anyways, I hope that that inspired you. I hope this, this little thing has been out of print for a long time, but you can still occasionally get it here and there on Amazon. Um, if you have an opportunity to pick this up, I highly recommend it. It's a great... Um, tool and it's really good for um, somebody that doesn't really know tarot very well but still wants to um, do some kind of work with cards it's great I just I love it I mean look at this thing I've kept it all these years this thing has been homeless with me and everything else <laughs> and I still have it so yeah that speaks volumes really to how much I connected with with that as well so I hope that I inspired you if you have an opportunity to get Kim's um, any of Kim's decks um, just do it. I mean, her artwork's phenomenal. I just, I absolutely um, adore her her stuff. And the Spirit Animal deck is just magic. It's, it's really magic. Um, I love it. So have a great day, you guys. Thanks for watching. And I love you guys so much.